All right, well, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's just go ahead and we're going to read the whole chapter um, here this afternoon. We're going to read the whole chapter uh, and then we'll, we'll jump into it. We're going to spend the next three weeks um, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, but um, we're going to break it down. Um, but first of all, we're going to go through and just read the entire chapter as we study to see what Paul has to say to Timothy, and then uh, through the Holy Spirit uh, and through Paul, what uh, God has to say for us as a church as well. So let's just go ahead and start off by reading 2 Timothy chapter 3 and starting in verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Now that verse is probably one that you look at and say, what in the world is he talking about there? Uh, we're probably not even going to get to that this week, but uh, hang in there next week. We'll, we'll explain what he's talking about. Verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Father, Lord, just thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the truth of it. Thank you for the clear um, teaching that you have given to us in scripture Lord, and I pray that you would help us to avoid um, those out there who would lead us astray from you, Lord, who would give us a different gospel, who would uh, try to teach us something about you that just isn't true, Lord, and they can be deceptive, they can sound right, they can sound good, Lord, they can have an appearance of godliness, but Lord, we know that um, anything that is contrary to the truth of Jesus Christ and his death and burial and resurrection, Lord, anything contrary to that um, is, is heresy, it's false teaching, Lord, help us to turn away from that, to not fall prey to that, but Lord, to stand firm on your word and on your truth. Lord, help us not to, um, yeah, just to fall into those traps, but Lord, to stay true to you, true to your word. Give me the words to speak here this afternoon. I pray that we would all be able to listen attentively, that you would uh, just work on our hearts through your, your Holy Spirit uh, to change our hearts and minds and help us to become more like you. Father, we, we just love you so much. You've blessed us with so many things. You've given us great fellowship here, great people, great church, great community to live in. Um, Lord, you just, you're, you've blessed us with so much. Help us to remember that, to honor you, to be grateful to you for all things. And Lord, we do pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Think about a field um, full of landmines, right? A field full of landmines is tricky. It's dangerous to walk through. As you're walking through it, you, you don't necessarily know where there might be a mine that you step on that's just going to um, explode or whatever, right? And so how do you know how to navigate through such a dangerous area? 
Well, I don't know if you ever feel like this, but in our modern times, our modern day and age, the world we live in, it can feel like we're walking through a spiritual minefield, right? As we're, as we're living our lives, as we're having all kinds of input coming into us from the internet and from TV, from people, um, from culture, whatever it is, it feels like we're living and walking through this spiritual minefield. In fact, Paul said in verse 1 of chapter 3, he said this, Know also that in the last days, perilous, and that word perilous means dangerous, times, shall come. Now Paul was writing to Timothy to warn him because he knew that Timothy and Paul were living in the last days. We are living in the last days. And you say, well, how do you know that? Well, the Bible is pretty clear on this. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 2 um, tells us that we're in the last days. I'll just read this for you. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 2 says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And so uh, whoever wrote the, the book of Hebrews is saying there that, that God in the past spoke through the prophets. In the Old Testament, he spoke through the, the, uh, the patriarchs, the prophets, the, um, you know, Moses, the law. That's how God spoke to us. And now in these last days, he speaks to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And so um, um, from the time of Christ's death and resurrection and ascension until the time of his return where he sets up his kingdom, we are in the last days. He could come back right now while I'm preaching. He could come back a thousand years from now, whenever it is. But we are now in what is called the last days. Now these times that we are in are perilous and dangerous. Whether you believe it or not. Now we can walk around, um, you know, and pretend like everything's fine and pretend like there's no issues. Pretend like, um, you know, there's no way I could ever fall prey to false teaching. There's no way I could be, ever be taken away by something that is contrary to what scripture says. But listen, we need to understand that these times are perilous. Paul wrote to Timothy. Timothy, who was a strong Christian, who was a pastor, uh, who, who received teaching directly from Paul. He said, Timothy, you are in perilous, dangerous times. Watch out. And so we as Christians need to watch out because there are false teachers that are looking to deceive and pull people away from the truth. And you see it everywhere, okay? You, you pull up YouTube and you type in God or you type in the Bible or whatever it is. You're going to get all kinds of false teaching, things that are going to try to pull you away from the truth of Jesus Christ. You're going to have people who, who come to church for the sole purpose of pulling you away from the truth of Jesus Christ. And this false teaching that we're running into, it's, it's deceptive. Okay, I don't want to, all right, I'm not trying to scare you, but I do want us to be aware. The false teaching is deceptive. It can look right. It can look like it's godly even. In verse 5, Paul warned Timothy, he said, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. That having a form means having an appearance, having a showing. It looks like it's godly. And so it can be deceptive. And if we're not careful, if we're not following what the Word of God says, we can be taken away from it or by it. But thankfully, through what Paul has written to Timothy here in chapter 3, we're given this guide to help us determine the false from the true. The false from the true. In verse 8, notice what Paul said. He said, Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. And then look what he says. He says, But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. These two men here, um, what he's referring to, are their names aren't given in the book of Exodus, but he's referring to the prophets in Egypt that um, stood up to Moses when God um, um, plagued Egypt with the ten plagues. And so here are these two prophets who were, who were with Pharaoh and with Egypt, and um, when Moses threw down his, snake, or, or his stick and God turned it into a snake, um, they were also able to do the same thing. They threw down their sticks and it turned into a snake. Um, or when Moses, uh, or when God, you know, plagued Egypt by turning the water into blood, they were able to do the same thing. They were able to, to, to they tried to withstand God um, with, their, with their enchantments and with their deception, but... If you read the story of Exodus, you'll see that they do not have the same power of God. They can try to imitate it. They can try their best to make it look like they're just as powerful as he is. But we saw that Moses' snake, um, snake stick 
I guess, swallowed up all the other snakes. Um, we saw that after a few plagues into it, they were unable to do what God was able to do. Um, and their folly or their inability to withstand God was shown. It was manifest to all men, and they were shown to be false prophets and false teachers. And it's the same thing with false teachers today. They may be able to imitate God up to a point. They may be able to look godly up to a point. They may be able to trick us up to a point, but they cannot demonstrate the full power of God. They cannot demonstrate uh, what God has demonstrated to us by sending his son to die on the cross for us. And so eventually, as long as we're sticking to God's word, as long as we're sticking to true teaching, eventually they will be exposed and they will be shown to be false. And we can follow Paul's instructions here to turn away from them. Where he says, from such, turn away. That means don't listen to them. Walk away from them. Don't engage them. Don't um, um, listen and follow their teaching, but instead turn away from them and turn towards true teaching. So what does God's word say about the difference between false teaching and true teaching? Well, there's three things that we notice in this chapter. Um, and rather than cover them as three points in one message, we'll, we'll take each one at a time and we'll cover them over the next three weeks. Now you might say, listen, you've, you've preached about the difference between false teaching and true teaching before. Now you're going to take another three weeks to do it. I mean, come on, can we talk about something else? But listen, it was important enough for Paul here in Timothy, uh, in both letters to Timothy, to cover it several times, to, to go into detail on it, to say, Timothy, this is something you need to watch out for. This is dangerous. This is something you need to protect the church from, protect your your heart from protect uh, protect yourself from it was important enough to Paul it was important enough for the Holy Spirit to inspire Paul for uh, to write it for us today and it is a major issue whether we believe it or not whether we we see it or not it is a major issue that the church deals with today and so we need reminders of these things and I don't think I think we could spend the next year covering the difference between false teaching and true teaching and and not be any worse off for it um, in fact Paul told Timothy to remind the church that he was there of the basics of the faith in chapter one or chapter two verse 14 he says of these things put them in remembrance charging them before the Lord um, there he was talking about remember remind them of the gospel remind them of the true teaching of Jesus um, we don't need anything new in fact that's one of the characteristics of false teaching we don't need anything new and inspiring we need to hear the truth of the word of God now imagine if you would I just want you to picture like a boxing match all right so we're at a boxing match and in one corner you have true teaching, you have right teaching, and the other corner, you have false teaching. And the announcer comes and he calls out, you know, ladies and gentlemen, right? And then he says, in this corner, we have true teaching. In this corner, we have false teaching. But instead of like starting to say, and the true teaching weighs is 130 pounds or whatever, he's not going to give out a weight, but the announcer is going to describe what true teaching looks like, describe what false teaching looks like. And that's what we're going to do over the next three weeks. We're going to let the word of God be our announcer as, as they go head to head and fight each other. The word of God is going to announce to us what a good description of false teaching is and a good description of what true teaching is. That way we can decide who we want to root for and who we want to root for in, in the match. And so the first thing we see here and what we have up first this week is false teachings, selfish ambition versus true teachings, selfless love. False teachings, selfish ambition, versus true teachings, selfless love. You see right off the bat in verse 3, sorry, verse 2, chapter 3, we see right off the bat that false teaching's purpose, its goal, its aim, its purpose, is selfish ambition. In verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, we see descriptors of false teachers. And all of these things describe someone who is selfish and someone who puts themselves above others and even above God. We'll just go through each of these. First of all, he says that, they're, that men will be lovers of their own selves. That kind of covers the whole thing there, right? They love themselves 
That means they put themselves first in all things. That means they give themselves grace. They give themselves mercy. They, they care about what they want, what they deserve. They, they think about themselves and they put themselves first in all things. Second, they're covetous. Covetous just means they desire what other people have. And not only do they desire what other people have, but they think that they deserve it, right? Where they think that they can deserve it, right? It would, it would be my, like me looking at John's car and being like, John's car is awesome and I want his car. Not only do I want the car, but he doesn't deserve that car. I work harder than he does. I'm a better person than he is. He doesn't deserve that. I deserve that. Right? That's what covetous is, and that's what these false teachers are. They look at other ministries, and, and they say, oh, this, uh, this person has people that, 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 that follow them, that love them, that uh, they have these big crowds. They have um, um, everything you could ever want for in a ministry. They don't deserve that. I deserve that, right? I'm a better preacher than they are. I'm a better teacher than they are. I know the Bible better than they do. I deserve that. They don't. That's what covetousness is. Then there's boasters. Boasters work really hard to make sure they get the recognition that they think they deserve. Where they make sure you're going to hear the good things that, you, that they do. They make sure that you're going to hear how smart they are. They make sure that you are going to hear how much better than they, they are than other people. And they may be a little bit um, sneaky about it, kind of like humble bragging or whatever it is. But they're going to make sure that they get the recognition that they think they deserve. Then there's proud. Pride, it's, it's just thinking more highly of themselves than they ought to. Where they look at themselves and they say, you know, everything um, that I have in my life comes from me. Um, you know, I'm so good. I know so much. It's all, it's all me, me, me. And, and, and too prideful to ever admit doing anything wrong. Too prideful to ever admit any mistakes, right? Then he says there's blasphemers. Blasphemers. Now, typically when we think about blasphemy, we think about blaspheming against God, right? Like using God's name in vain. And that's part of it. But really what the word blasphemy means is just speaking evil of others. Speaking evil of others. And so it's used to talk about God because if you say something wrong or bad about God or use God's name in vain, you are speaking evil about him. You are committing sin or blasphemy against him. But the, it's just kind of a blanket word that means speaking evil of others. So you think about people who are gossipers, who, are, who talk bad about other people in order to elevate themselves. And so in ministry or in teaching, what that looks like is, is, is you know, if I were to get up here and just start to, to rail on other preachers and just talk about how bad they are, or about um, all the things that they had get wrong, or, or, or about how their ministry philosophy is just so much worse than, uh, you know, within ours is, or whatever it is. That would, be, that would be blaspheming, speaking evil of others to elevate themselves. And he says, disobedient to parents. And this one's interesting. You say, well, are false teachers, like, are they supposed to obey their parents like they're a child or something? Well, it's either that or what Paul's trying to say here is that they are giving their thoughts and their feelings preeminence over the authorities in their life. Right? It's, it's this idea that, oh, you know, you think about children, and, and children can tend to do this, and that's why we work with them, and we try to help them, and we um, try to discipline them where it's necessary. But, but children can sometimes tend to think, oh, I know a little bit more than my parents do, and the way I think about something or the way I feel about something is more important than the authority that my parents have, right? And, and those of you in this room who have parents know exactly what I'm talking about. And so these false teachers or these people who try to lead people away from Christ kind of carry with them this idea that their thoughts and their feelings are more important than the authorities that are laid out in their lives. Or not even necessarily the authorities in their lives, but maybe even scripture, right? As you, see, you see this in progressive Christianity and, and, and uh, people who, um, you know, just, just want to um, go off and live in their sin, regardless of what the Bible says. They think their feelings, their thoughts, they elevate those over the authority of scripture. Then there's unthankful, unthankful. This means they think they deserve what they have or they deserve more than what they have and not being grateful. Similar to the illustration, right, where I'm thinking about John's car. Rather than being grateful for our minivan, 
Uh, I think I deserve more than that, right? That's being unthankful. Unholy. Unholy. This is unwilling to separate themselves from the world and follow God, but would rather pursue the comforts of the world. Again, you see this in, in all kinds of, of, of teaching out there where it's like instead of separating for our, ourselves from the world, instead we're like, oh, the world has changed, culture's changed, but the Bible hasn't changed. Well, we're going to go along with culture. We're going to go along with the world. We're going to go along with politics rather than being holy and separate from the world and sticking to what God's word says. Without natural affection. What this really means um, is it's actually talking about this idea of being unloving towards those that they should love. Um, it's kind of like, imagine a neglectful parent, right? You, you, you hear stories about it in the news and it, it breaks your heart, it breaks my heart whenever you hear about a parent who um, um, just somehow is lacking in love towards their children and they either hurt them or neglect them or whatever it is. Um, it, it's like we, we view that as unnatural. We're like, what in the world is, is wrong with them, right? Because natural affection is loving your children. Natural affection is loving your family. Natural affection is, is being loving towards those who you naturally would be loving towards. And the lack of natural affection means they're unloving towards those that they should naturally love. Then we'll go through these a little bit more quickly here. Uh, truce breakers, false accusers, traitors, despisers of those that are good. Uh, you can kind of wrap those all up in this idea that they are slanderers and are willing to betray anyone and everyone to get what they want. They get angry at those who do good because it makes them look bad, and so they make attempts at tearing them down, right? We, we've all seen this. You see this in high school drama. You see this um, even in adult drama, right, where, uh, 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 where, where people should be grown adults, but instead they're, they're, they're trying to, like, gossip here and gossip there. They make a promise that they, that they don't follow through with. They falsely accuse people. They betray people. They, they get angry at people for doing the right thing because it makes them look bad, and so they're, they want to slander them. They want to tear them down, right? Um, and, and that's what we see from these, these false teachers. And he says, incontinent and fierce. This means that they lack self-control and they get unreasonably angry. Rather than, um, you know, maybe somebody does something that upsets them, um, rather than just saying, okay, well, maybe they had a reason for that. Let's find out what's going on. No, instead they lose control and get unreasonably angry. Heady, high-minded. This means they're rash and reckless because they think they're invincible and, and because they're willing to do whatever it takes to get what they want. And so they're heady and high-minded. And then lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. This means they love pleasure. They love their own good. They love what they feel like they want. They love their own feelings. They look at making their lives comfortable and pleasurable rather than um, doing what their creator who made them would have them to do. Now, Again, all of these describe someone who is selfish and who pursues selfish ambition, who says, I'm going to get what I want, I'm going to get what I deserve, I'm going to make my ministry, I'm going to make my teaching, I'm going to make what I tell other people all about me and how I can get what I want out of them. Just remember, these, what Paul is talking about here to Timothy and warning him of are people who are describing themselves or making themselves out to be teachers. Even Christian teachers, these are people in the church that he's talking about. He's talking about people that are claiming at least to be in the church. People who are claiming um, the name of Jesus. People um, who are claiming to be church leaders or, or in the ministry or whatever it is. But they're not teaching for the good of the gospel. They're not teaching for the good of God. They're not teaching for Jesus Christ or for others. They're teaching because they're pursuing their own good, their own gain, maybe their own self-preservation. These are the people who, again, are out there on YouTube that are just looking for likes and follows, right? Or people who are, 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 are setting up a church in order to... Um, um, be able to live and walk in their own sin and claim that it's okay because um, what the Bible says about it doesn't matter. Or, or, or people um, who, who claim you know, various things about Jesus that aren't true. Again, to, to get people to, 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 come to, their, uh, to come to their church, to get the crowds, to get the money, whatever it is. 
And so we need to watch out for these things. Everything that we just went through, these signs of supposed teachers, we need to watch out for these. We also need to watch out for these signs in ourselves. Because everything that I just read is something that probably all of us face at one point or another in our lives. All of us, as long as we live in these bodies, we may be saved, we may be born again, but we struggle with sin, we struggle with selfishness. And so maybe there's an area here of something that we just read through that you may need to confess and get it right with God and get it right with others. As we said before, we're all teachers in some way or another. We either teach our kids, we teach our friends, uh, we're trying to give the gospel to people that we know. What's an area in your life where maybe you're selfish, where you're pursuing selfish ambition rather than love? Maybe you need to confess that and get that right with God. So we see the purpose of false teaching is selfish ambition, but conversely, the purpose of true teaching is selfless love. The purpose of true teaching is selfless love. Where do you get that from? Well, Paul, Paul gave himself as an example of a true teacher in verse 10. He says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions. Notice everything that Paul just used to describe himself. Now, he wasn't bragging here. He wasn't boasting. He was trying to give Timothy a picture of what someone who's following Jesus Christ looks like. And Paul was not pursuing selfish ambition. He was pursuing his love for God, and he was pursuing his love for others by giving them the gospel. See, Paul's whole purpose in his life, his whole purpose in his work, everything that he, he stood for, everything that he worked for, his whole purpose in his life was the gospel. And he was clear on his doctrine and clear on his teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 2 and verse 8. He says, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. And so that was Paul's purpose. Right? To preach Jesus Christ. To share Jesus Christ with others. And so he said, Timothy, you've known. So here, these false teachers, right? They're going to have selfish ambition. They're going to be selfish, self-centered. These, these signs are going to show up in them. Watch out for them. But you've known me. You've known, he didn't mention them here, but I'm sure he could have. You've known uh, Peter. You've known John. You've known James. You've known uh, the apostles, right? And everything they shared about Jesus Christ. You've known the word of God that is the revelation of Jesus Christ, right? You've known that. And when you look at that, you look at a true teacher. You look at a true um, apostle in this time, but in our time, a true teacher of Jesus Christ. What do you see? Paul talked about his manner of life. In other words, his walk. It was consistent in Christ. He consistently walked with Christ. He, he denied himself, took up his cross, and followed him. He says his purpose. He says, you fully know my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose. His purpose was the gospel, and his purpose was giving it to the lost. Uh, I'll read for you here Romans chapter 1. Paul's purpose wasn't to gain anything for himself, to make himself look good, to gain any money or wealth or power. His purpose was the gospel. Romans chapter 1, verse 14. He says, I am debtor both to the Greeks, to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so Paul is telling Timothy, you know my purpose. It's the gospel, to preach the gospel, to teach people about Jesus Christ. And then he also had faith. We know that Paul had faith in Christ. He continued to walk with him by faith. But notice the last three words that he uses in verse 10. It says, long-suffering, charity, patience. If you look at verses 2 through 5, see these selfish traits of a false teacher, they don't line up very well with the loving traits of a true teacher, do they? 
the kind of the total opposite. See, Paul not only experienced the love of Christ through the gospel, not only did Christ love him and save him and, and die on the cross for his, his sins, but then Paul took that and lived out the love of Christ in his life. He had charity and love towards others. He says, you've known my long suffering and my patience. It, it, it takes a lot of love to be long suffering and patient. See, Paul was willing to endure irritations from other people because of love. He was willing to endure suffering that other people brought him into because of love. He was willing to be patient and to be kind to people because of love. He was willing to put the good of others over his own good because of love. See, someone who's a lover of, them, of the, their own selves, someone who's prideful, someone who is high-minded, someone who is um, a truce breaker, false accuser, etc., etc., cetera, et cetera, et cetera they're, they're going to be lacking in that patience, that long-suffering, and that love. In fact, Paul was even willing to go so far as to suffer persecution for the love of Christ and others. Look at verse 11. He says, Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. And if you read through the book of Acts, you'll see that Paul was, went through so much in these cities, right? He was taken, he was beaten, he was stoned. Um, he had all kinds of things happen to him. And then here as he writes this letter, he's imprisoned, um, probably about to be executed at this point. And he endured suffering, he endured persecution for the, for the cause of Christ. But he was willing to do so. He was all about it. He said, yep, it's worth it. This is, this is what um, I should be doing. Chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. Paul says, Where did I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds? But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Notice what, again, notice the difference between Paul there and the false teachers. The false teachers are willing to tear anybody down, to hurt anybody, to get what they want. But a true teacher is willing to go through whatever suffering, whatever persecution, whatever affliction, whatever pain they have to go through to make sure people hear the gospel, to make sure people are loved, to make sure people are taught what is true. They're willing to endure that suffering and endure that pain, whereas a false teacher on the, on the opposite end is willing to cause pain to get whatever they want. So you can tell the difference there. Now listen, for ourselves here this, this afternoon, anyone who truly follows Christ, what does Paul say in verse 12? They will suffer persecution. He says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Are we willing, I have to ask myself this, am I willing to endure suffering out of love for Christ and others? Are we willing to endure that suffering because we love Christ and we love others? Or are we like the false teachers who want to seek out what we want, who want to seek out what we can get, who want to seek out how we can be comfortable, who want to seek out how can we be happy, regardless of whoever we have to hurt to get it, regardless of whatever um, twisting of scripture we have to use to get it, regardless of whatever teaching we have to throw out there to get it, regardless of however we have to treat people to get it, I'm going to have my happiness, I'm going to have what I want, I'm going to have what I deserve in this life, or are we willing to suffer for Christ? And so as we see, the purpose of true teaching is love. Now we've got to be careful with that because false teaching will claim love. False teaching will say, oh, we're all about love. In fact, the love of Jesus trumps what the Bible says. And so when we say, uh, uh, when you use the word love, that means that, um, you know, we can love whoever we want, right? Promoting unscriptural marriage, things of that nature. And false teaching will claim love. False teachers can be deceiving and look like they're godly when they're not. As it says in verse 5, having a form of godliness, 
but denying the power there, thereof. And so you'll see churches out there. You'll see people um, coming into churches who, 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 who look loving, who look like they know the Bible, who look like they're godly, who will carelessly throw the word love around, but what they're actually pursuing is selfish lust. And I think you know what I'm talking about there. Where it's like, I get to do whatever I want, and, and love means I get to live in whatever sin I want to live in, where actually I'm just pursuing selfish gain and twisting Scripture to allow for that. But we see what real love is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, what does real love look like? In verse 4, notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say charity means you affirm everybody's actions and thoughts. Charity means everybody gets to do whatever they want and live however they want. Charity means my happiness is more important than anything else. No, that's not what he says. What does he say? Verse 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Charity suffereth long, is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. That is what love looks like. And true teaching is always given in love. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse, four, uh, verse 15. I know this verse has been thrown around in conversation in Forest Hills lately, and it's a good verse. It certainly applies to um, a lot of things. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15 says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And so true teaching is always given in love because it's the truth, but it's also given in love. Now when we say the truth given in love, we're not talking about some kind of like feeling. We're not talking about, um, you know, being like, oh, I love you so much, but I got to give you the truth, kind of hug you as you say it kind of thing. I don't know. I'm, you know what I'm trying to say. But the purpose of this passage here is the context that we see is to show what true teaching does is it builds up in Christ as we learn more about him, as we're changed to be more like him, as we hear what his word has to say, as the Holy Spirit works through us, as we do this teaching, the whole purpose is to mold us to become more like Christ, to build us up in him. And so true teaching, it's not about selfish ambition. It's not about how many tithers can we get. It's not about um, how, how can people love me more. It's not about how I can get away with whatever sin I want to get away with because I can twist scripture around. You no, know, true teaching is not about selfish ambition at all, but it's about loving people by building them up in Christ, by giving them the word of God to say, hey, I, I love you, brother. I love you, sister. And so this is what the word of God says. And so I pray that the Holy Spirit will work in you to change you to become more like Christ. And that is what true teaching looks like. So, who are you rooting for in the boxing match? The selfish ambition of false teaching or the selfless love of true teaching? Another question, what do you see the most in the teachers that you choose to follow and listen to? Or maybe even more importantly, what we should all think about this morning or this afternoon, what do you see the most in yourself, in your own heart, in your own life? See, if we're going to navigate the perilous spiritual minefield of the last days, we have to recognize the false from the true. And one of the biggest indicators that we see here in this passage is whether we are pursuing selfish ambition or pursuing selfish love. Now listen, we're all sinners. I'm a sinner. We are all sinners who struggle with selfishness from, from time to time. And so I do encourage you here to, to examine your life. And listen, as a church as we seek to make disciples for Jesus, as we teach and preach the word of God, we have to make sure we are doing it in love. So what selfishness do you need to confess to God today? 
Maybe what selfishness do you need to go to somebody about today and confess to them to say, hey, I'm sorry, I was acting selfish in this way or in this manner. Who are you following and listening to that you know is pursuing their own selfish ambition? We need to turn away from them and stop following and stop listening to them. I would also say on the flip side, who are you following and listening to that you know is pursuing love? Maybe your parents, maybe um, a friend in your life, maybe someone in the church that you know is like trying to help you out with something and you know that they love you and they're pursuing your good. Continue to listen to them, to follow them, and encourage them as they continue to teach you the truth in love. And so as we try to understand what selfish ambition versus selfless love looks like, let me encourage you with this as we close. This is all about Jesus. This is all about Christ. This is all about him. He's given us the ultimate example. Philippians chapter 2, verses um, 3 through 8. And I'll end with this. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. This is Jesus Christ himself giving us the ultimate example of selfless love instead of selfish ambition. Verse 3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The purpose of false teaching is selfish ambition. The purpose of true teaching is selfless love. Who do you think has the advantage in the match so far? We'll, uh, we'll, we'll get into the other reasons over the next couple of weeks, but for now, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, Lord, just thank you so much again for your word. Thank you for this church. Thank you for everyone that is here. I pray that you would just continue to work in our hearts and in our lives. Help us to become more like you, more focused on you. Help us to love one another, to care for one another, to not pursue our own selfish gain, but to pursue you. Help us to love you and live our lives for you. Lord, if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you, I pray that you draw them to you, help them to come to know you today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.